A student's dorm flooded back in March says she expected more from university housing and questions of whether the Black Lives Matter movement is only relevant when a tragic death arises is answered. All this and more on Panther Report News. Hello and welcome to Panther Report News. I'm Keelan Barian. The deadline to withdraw from all fall 2020 courses have been extended to October 30th. So if you're still unsure about classes, Panthers, you still have a little bit more time. One Georgia State student experienced difficulties while living in the university housing. Mulan Gary experienced this from a flood in her dorm, which she believes she received little to no help from Georgia State. And I have her story. If you have ever been in a situation similar to Mulan Gary, then you understand the frustration that sometimes occur from living in Georgia State University's housing. I'm definitely feeling frustrated. On March 6, Gary and her roommate's dorm was flooded by an HVAC pipe burst in Patton Hall. It was actually my roommate who had called me. She FaceTimed me and she was like, um, look. <laughs> and there was just water coming in from the ceiling. Damaging all of her belongings in the process. GSU wasn't liable for any of my things and neither was Corvius. The two of them sent emails to the University Housing and Corvus Company, some containing invoices of her damaged belongings, but little to no response were giving back. Gary took her situation to social media, posting a video of her dorm that received over 3,000 views. Students from Georgia State were upset posting comments towards the university. In response, the university made the same comment back to everyone saying they empathize with her frustration and the matter is now what Corvius Company living. And after trying to reach out to interim director of university housing, Shannon Corey, she was unavailable to speak to us. Milan's post drew a lot of attention from those who attend the university and even started to see more responses to her emails. But all the university could do for the two roommates was move them from Patton Hall over to the student lofts. We hadn't really been comfortable because they were strangers, so we ended up actually like sleeping on our friend in Patton's floor for like the next week until we were sent home. It kind of, it sucked. <laughs> While staying at Patton Hall, Gary mentions that she sometimes had problems with the pipes, referring to having no water for a few days after returning back from winter break. Um, so I was taking showers at the gym, which sucked. <laughs> oh, and even asked for help from maintenance. Yeah, we put in so many maintenance requests, like the entire time we lived in Patton. Gary has other siblings that were interested in attending Georgia State University, but from Gary's experience, living conditions would not be made in university housing. I have like three siblings and all of them were looking forward to going to Georgia State and I don't think any of them will be living on campus either in any of the dorms. Keevan Barian, PRN. Georgia State provides students with intellectual and developmental disability opportunities to build in a community in college. This organization's goal is to build a community that is ideal for everyone, and they need your help to do so. PRN's reporter and international correspondent, Melissa Perez, tell us why. The Center for Leadership and Disability at Georgia State offers a project called the Inclusive Post-Secondary Education Consortium which serves to provide students with intellectual and developmental disabilities the opportunity to grow a community in college. Here in the state of Georgia, there are nine programs, and here at Georgia State, we hear from IDEAL. Georgia State University's Inclusive Digital Expression and Literacy Program, or better known as IDEAL, has one important mission for its students. Our mission is to give students not only that academic knowledge, but that social knowledge. And all of our students specialize in the creative and digital media. So all things theater, music, pretty much what the world of Atlanta gives us, that's specializing in. Ideal started at Georgia State in 2017 with only two students. Today, in 2020, it has grown and flourished and would like to get this message across. Inclusivity is how we get to equality for all. Um, and I think what inclusive education is, what ideal is, is just showing and allowing a space for everyone to be their individual selves, but to be given the same opportunity that others are given. Not only does ideal provide a safe environment for its students, 
but also gives their students a real hands-on opportunity. We also do internships and apprenticeships. So people are learning directly with folks that are working in the field of their dreams. Um, so right now we have an acting apprenticeship where we have two students working directly with a working actor who has his own production company modeling agency and um, is in David Makes Man on OWN Network. Um, they're working together to put together portfolios, get headshots in line, have casting videos. Funding for IDEAL is based on a federal grant and it's coming to its end in October, which leaves a lot of uncertainties. We have applied for another grant as a state consortium and we are waiting to hear, but like all things, um, there's a lot of question marks. There are many opportunities for Georgia State students to be a part of this organization, from becoming a peer mentor to helping share on Instagram for their crowdfunding campaign. Kara Davis speaks about crowdfunding. But the crowdfunding campaign in particular, we it is for technology for our students, especially in this digital state, in this digital space, excuse me. Creative and digital media means you need a creative platform. As a peer mentor for Ideal, Lee gives us her experience. And just being able to learn from them and there's things that they can learn from me, you know what I mean? And just accepting that because we're all different, we have something that we're great at, that we're good at, that we can share and that we can learn and teach to other people. So yeah, that's, that's what it's about. Spencer Norris gives us her perspective of what Ideal is trying to build, not only at Georgia State, but as a community. Diversity is brilliant. Um, interdependence is how we become successful. Um, I think meeting people in their humanness who are different than you, but really the same at the core. We all want to have friends, have good jobs, and have good lives, right? So I think this community that we're building is life-giving and life-saving, um, and we try to be as ideal as possible. Melissa Perez, PRN. And now we turn to Tariq Wynn for the latest updates on PR Wynn Sports. Thanks, Keelan. What's up, guys? I'm Tariq Wynn, and welcome to PR and Sports. The Georgia State volleyball team fell to Chattanooga 3-2 in their season opener, but the good news that came out of this game was the fact that senior Misha Griffin beat her personal record by notching 21 kills and sophomore Spicer Gordon had a career high of 23 digs. Georgia State dropped the first two sets because of Chattanooga's red-hot offense. Also, GSU setters couldn't capitalize on all of Georgia State's offensive weapons. In November, Georgia State will be hosting the Sunbelt Conference for soccer. PRN's Brianna Malone spoke with men's soccer coach Brett Serency and goalkeeper Paul Tyson to learn a little bit more on how they plan to dominate the conference and how they are preparing for this season. On September 4th, Georgia State released the 2020 fall schedule for the men's soccer team. Coach Brett Serency already has a plan of action ready to execute in order to have a winning season and to dominate the Sun Belt Conference in November. Prepared for um, just some philosophical things that we believe in in the program and um, kind of building uh, day by day, you know, before our first game. And then, you know, as we hit games and have a bit of a foundation for what we look like as a team, then, you know, we'll start making some tweaks and some adjustments as we go along the way too. Coach Serency isn't the only one making sure the team has a victorious season. Goalkeeper Paul Tyson and the rest of the team are preparing even though circumstances are a bit different this year. Um, but we're just working hard as a team to make sure that when we have our first game this Friday versus Mesa, that we are fully prepared as we normally would be. Uh, we've had a lot of obstacles coming into this season, but um, the players and the staff have done an excellent job of just making sure that we can make this as normal as possible and go out there and perform like we normally do. The men's soccer team will take on Mercer University September 18th at 7 p.m. Here at Georgia State Sports Arena, Brianna Malone, PRN. 
The Georgia State women's soccer team got a victory against Mercer University in overtime. Mercer tied the score up in the 70th minute of the, of the game, which took both teams to overtime. In overtime, Georgia State snuck a kick past the goalkeeper just three minutes into overtime, which gave Georgia State the victory. And speaking of the women's soccer team, we would like to give a big congratulations to freshman Brooke Hart. Brooke Hart was named the Georgia State Athlete of the Week. She led the Panthers to victory against Mercer on Friday, September 11th in overtime. The final score of the soccer match was 2-1. to one. In today's age, social injustice has been a very hot topic in discussion among the sports world. PRN's Cora Ben Israel spoke with two-time Super Bowl champion Anthony Smith on how athletes all over the world are making a difference with their platform. This year, athletes have gone above and beyond to force the conversation about social injustice with their platform. I had the opportunity to speak with two-time Super Bowl champion Anthony Smith to get his opinion about the athletes forcing this conversation. Now, instead of, okay, you just get interviewed in a locker room and then, you know, they cut it and edit it how they want to, um, now, you know, we have the platforms to speak and say exactly what we want to, how exactly we want to. So I think, you know, that's what gives athletes now a bigger advantage than athletes before. Smith feels that athletes have always had that responsibility. The only difference now is that today's athletes have their own outlet to say how they truly feel. Guys and always, you know, uh, have had, you know, boisterous leaders. Um, it's just now with the platform, they kind of don't get to pick and choose, you know, who they want to, who they want to interview. It's kind of like now everybody gets to say what they want to say and you can pretty much hear what everybody wants to say versus, you know, the, the media picking one or two guys who, you know, you always hear from. Smith also mentions the fact that social media helps us see things we normally wouldn't be able to see. With the social media, all the new social medias now is really putting, it's, it's really making life very transparent. You know, before, when we didn't have all these platforms, you couldn't, you, you can control the narrative more, but now when you see these videos, to hear about it is one thing and to see all the stats is one thing, but now we're actually seeing videos of everything that's been going on for the years. He also feels that if he and his peers were able to have access to social media back then, that there would have been a different result. Like nowadays, I don't think, you know, everybody uh, would have jumped on it, but I think it would have, it, there would have been a plethora of guys who would have took advantage of, you know, the social media aspect and what was going on. Current and former athletes all over the country will continue to use their platform to keep the conversation about social injustice alive. Here from Georgia State Sports Arena, Koa Ben Israel, PRN. A few weeks ago, the NFL kicked off their 2020 season, and if you watch a few of the games, you may have seen some Georgia State University alumni on some of those NFL fields. The Georgia State's punter and place kicker, Brandon Wright, is the most recent planter to earn a spot on an NFL team. He has signed as a free agent with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Also, former receiver Penny Hart has also signed with the Seattle Seahawks. Furthermore, New Orleans Saints kicker Will Lutz continues to dominate in his position. He is one of the NFL's top place kickers and earlier this year became the first Georgia State alumni to make it to the Pro Bowl. Some other alumni to look out for this year are Chandon Sullivan on the Green Bay Packers and Albert Wilson, Ulrich John, and Robert Davis. Congratulations to all those Georgia State alumni. And speaking of the NFL, the Atlanta Falcons held their season opener in Mercedes-Benz Stadium against Russell Wilson and the Seattle Seahawks a, a few weeks ago. But they fell to the Seahawks 38-25. Quarterback Matt Ryan threw for over 400 passing yards and two touchdown passes. Wide receiver Calvin Ridley caught two touchdown passes from Ryan. Also during the game, Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson had four touchdowns and threw for over 300 passing yards. Chris Carson caught two touchdown passes from Russell Wilson. 
Well, during the show, we always keep you guys up to date on what Georgia State sports teams are doing, and we tell you a little bit about what the athletes have going on. But you actually have a chance to get out and get a little athletic yourself. Georgia State University will be hosting its inaugural Pounce Around Town Virtual 5K One Mile Run. This virtual event will take place from October 10th to the 18th. Registration is $25, and the first 300 individuals to sign up will receive a Georgia State Gator and a race bib. For more information on how to register, visit georgiastatesports.com slash 5K. Well, that wraps it up for this edition of PRN Sports. Make sure you guys stay safe out there. I'm Tyreek Wynn. Keelan, back to you. Black Lives Matter, a movement that exploded with worldwide attention due to the tragic deaths of an unarmed blacks by police brutality still continues to be heard. The movement has struck attention from the media and oftentimes comes to a halt until another unfortunate killing of a black person by a police officer emerges. Questions have surfaced whether the media only covers the Black Lives Matter movement when these dreadful deaths come to light. PRN's reporter Jared Gear decides to find some answers. 2020 has been a year filled with commotion. I suppose that the only small source of comfort for me is knowing that he died doing what he loved the most. This is a global pandemic. Breaking news in the search for Hollywood actress Naya Rivera. With a worldwide pandemic still in effect and elected officials trying to figure out how to rebuild the economy, believe it or not, these streets, as well as other places internationally, looked like this. Obviously, the media is only going to showcase what is relevant to people during that time period at that moment. So here's my question. Do black lives only matter when it's trending? Some say yes, others say no. Um, the only times black lives matter to me in opinion is when it gets quote unquote violent. I don't know, there's um, like the performative activism. It was just seen as like a trend and now that it's not trending anymore, people just kind of are blowing it off and acting like it's not still a real issue. Black Lives Matter, a movement reiterating the importance of withholding equal rights amongst African-American citizens while demanding justice for the lives lost due to police brutality or hate crimes. Some people just kind of choose to ignore what's happening because it's not happening to them. Your energy will get sent to certain things when it seems like it's the right time for society like they'll seem like it's trending like oh this is a cool thing to do now and then they'll do that but like on because you know people are trans lives are always dying every single day like for just being trans but no one really covers it only when it blows up it seems to be like a trend or that's when more awareness is brought to it but it shouldn't be like that jared gear panther report news According to the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, the coronavirus is killing Hispanics, Blacks, and American Indians at a much higher number than whites. Previous studies have found the coronavirus death toll for people of color to be twice as high under the age of 65 compared to white Americans. These disproportionate deaths could be from underlying health disparities, but also social disparities like food insecurities and crowded living conditions. Thank you all for tuning in this week's episode of Panther Report News. Be sure to follow us on all social media platforms at GSU PRN. And let us know what you think about the show. I'm Keelan Berrien, and we will see you next week.